Welcome, Laurent. Thank you for joining us today. I'm really excited to have this conversation about dots and what's going on at Unity behind the scenes. So before we get started, can you just briefly tell everybody what your position is at Unity and what it is that you're doing? Well, uh, first, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here and be able to share some of the information we have around dots, but also maybe unveil a little bit how Unity works. That's always kind of super exciting for, for people to learn about those things. I'm a lead product manager. I have a, a team of product managers working specifically on Dots. Uh, the Dots team is part of Unity Engine within Unity. And um, we are focusing on delivering all the data-oriented technologies to uh, Unity users. Wow, that sounds really big and like a huge responsibility. So I, I'm really excited to talk to you, but I don't envy that job at all. <laughs> so to get started, for people who are kind of unfamiliar with the technology, can you explain what DOTS means and kind of what it is overall? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's been uh, always a little bit complicated to explain uh, the details because sometimes we've been referring to DOTS as uh, a little bit of a, a product, a set of packages, a set of technologies, sometimes also a philosophy, data-oriented design is something that we, we talked a lot about when we talk about DOTS. So it's, it's not always easy to understand the scope of that. So I have a little bit of a drawing that helps us understand that a little bit better. So I'm going to just show you that uh, right away. Um, so when we talk about dots, uh, what it means that is data-oriented technology stack. And when we talk about data-oriented, it's in opposition of object-oriented, which is the very classic way of developing software uh, since you know forever, uh, well, a long time ago at least. So data-oriented is a different paradigm that you would use to um, focus on the efficiency of data transfer and processing before you know the software that you write uh, along that data. And that brings a lot of benefits. So data-oriented technology stack is a set of tools that we've been working on for years. And that set of tools includes a certain number of uh, elements to it. Uh, two of them at the bottom of the stack over here, scheduling and compilation, done by two packages called the C-sharp job system and verse compiler, are two elements of the technology that were already available for quite a long time and been using in, in Unity games for uh, a number of years. Another aspect of that that is a little bit the core of what is data-oriented is uh, what we call an ECS architectural pattern, ECS for Entity Component System. That's just a way to write the architecture of the game. And ECS has been experimental for quite a long time, but this is really what data oriented, um, where data oriented benefits will come from because you organize the architecture of your game in a way that you can make the best out of the data you have. So this it looks really cool and I'm really excited to start using entities myself, but can you explain to everybody else what the real benefit is here? Like why would you want to switch over to this? What What is the reason for this whole new system instead of object-oriented? You mentioned this is different from object-oriented like we're used to. So what's the reason for it? Yeah, this is a, a very good question. We've been, Unity started almost 15 years ago now. And when we started Unity, we made uh, a bunch of choices in terms of how the engine is being architectured. And uh, those choices helped us just fuel the majority of games on the market today, which is amazing. Like the choices we made 15 years ago are having a huge impact on all of the creators today making games with Unity. But at a certain point, uh, because of some of the choices we made, um, specifically we're talking here about game objects, mono behaviors, a certain number of those concepts are creating a barrier to get to bigger games. So the way we like to refer to the value of um, what we're trying to accomplish with that today is to bring the average level of complexity of what users can do with games today to the next level and allowing you to go through some of the architectural barrier that you would find in Unity Engine and just enable you to get to that more ambitious gameplay, that more ambitious simulation, that more ambitious AI, that more ambitious next step of the game that you want to reach out to, but maybe you weren't able to do that specifically because of some of the uh, way Unity works today. So Dots is a change in paradigm. It introduces a new way to consider how you structure your project to get new benefits, specifically when you want to break some of those limitations. 
And uh, I'll get to some of the limitation a little bit later. I have uh, examples of where we're uh, helping break uh, the, uh, the architecture limits. Nice. It's really exciting to see some of the examples, too, and some of the demos. I actually got a, a tiny little sneak peek at GDC that I'm not sure I can talk about that was really cool, and uh, I saw some of the, the really awesome benefits there. But I wanted to quickly jump over to what's going on with Dots. Why is there just all of a sudden this big announcement now? There was you know, I heard about Dots years ago, got really excited about it, kind of waited. Um, waited and waited and waited and then i haven't heard anything in a while the whole world kind of went and changed so what's what's happened what was what's the process here and uh what happened along the way there yeah i have a little bit of a, a small video that is a, a recap of um when we talked about dots we, we started really introducing dots um the the first time uh in big was unite 2017 if i'm not mistaken uh, here I have a little bit of Joaquin that was presenting one of the demo we were showcasing at the time, talking about large-scale simulation. Uh, and then when we came back in 2018, we came back with a big demo that was called Megacity. Uh, so that was again at Unite. And Megacity was all about very large-scale streaming of content and data. And that was uh, absolutely um, amazing. And then in 2019, we uh, were showcasing some of the new development we're making with Dots, some of the authoring workflows and some of the netcode capabilities that were um, getting introduced into the overall stack. And then, uh, you know, 2019, uh, we got into 2020, uh, we got into COVID, but we also, we also uh, made a few choices internally in how we were trying to deliver the technology that weren't super efficient. Then we kind of hesitated a little bit, waiting for getting back to normal, and it wasn't really happening. And then uh, we were also getting a lot of our early adopters um, asking for help for a number of their production. So we've been kind of hesitating a little bit on how to progress from there, what is exactly the next step that we want to achieve. And um, we stopped and paused the releases for a little while, um, trying to figure out exactly what was the next step for us. That has always uh, been a very large ambition for the technology team um, to, to get to uh, very complex game development. Uh, but at the same time, I think something that we realized uh, over the last year is that we also are trying to help uh, all of the existing Unity users and as opposed to maybe make a, a huge revolution where we were kind of basically uh, intending to build a replacement technology for Unity, instead we've chosen to adopt a transition, basically meaning that getting the dot value proposition, integrating that into the engine one step at a time in an incremental manner. And that's when we started doing releases. So um, the... Since December-ish, I think uh, the first time that we kind of reconnected with the community and began to share information again was uh, beginning of December. We made a first post over there. And since then, at least once every three months, we're communicating what's an update to the roadmap and exactly what are the next steps we're going through. And those next, next steps are pretty simple for this year. Uh, we are trying to get to... Um, um, to one specific target, which is a stable and supported for production version of the dot .stack. Um, if you remember that little drawing that I was showing earlier, uh, we have a few elements of dots that are already ready for production, but ECS was experimental. And experimental meant changing a little bit of the time and not we were not providing a lot of bug fixes that users were reporting. We want to change this and make that foundation a tool that you can use in production. And that's the main target for this year. So. Uh, basically, we have reconnect with the community and we have a single objective, which is get to a 1.0 version of uh, the ECS framework that will be uh, released and usable in production like any other feature of Unity. And to get there, it's three simple steps that we needed to go through, basically catching up with the train of releases of Unity. Um, the first one is Entities 015, 050, sorry. Entity 050 uh, is uh, the first milestone that we reached uh, just before GDC. And uh, we released 050, so you can get access to it. It's the experimental version of uh, ECS. So we're having 
you know, we, we are not in a situation to be able to support it really for production. So we we'll still recommend to not use it in production. But there is a number of new things that happen with uh, 050. And then the next step for us uh, that is planned for this quarter is 051. 050 brought compatibility with 2020 LTS. 051 will bring compatibility to 2021 LTS. So basically catching up with the Unity versions. And then the real target uh, for this year is uh, reaching an Entities 1.0. And this one will mean that we are finally being compatible with an LTS version in which you can use ECS as uh, a supported feature in production. Nice. That's really exciting to be able to actually get up to the 1.0 release and, and have that out there. I, I have to ask, so is there a big jump in technological knowledge between 51 and 1? Or is it if you understand 51, you're going to have a pretty easy time upgrading to Entities 1 once it's released? When we consider the larger concept of ECS, at least the philosophy of being data-oriented uh, when you design your game, it's very similar the general concepts since the beginning. So if you were using Entity 017 through 050 to 1.0, you're going to find the same concepts all over again. Entity component system, the same architecture, the same concepts apply. What will be different is the APIs we provide by default with those packages. Uh, so from 017 to 050, it's a breaking change. That's going to be, you know, game code that you're going to have to update to get through that transition, but we do provide a migration guide. And then from 050 to 051, it's a very minor update. It's all about compatibility with 2021 LTS. And from 051 to 1.0, there's going to be a breaking change again. Some classes have been deprecated, some new APIs uh, take over. Um, but um, depending on the game, it might or might not be uh, a big change. As soon as we're going to have a pre-release of 1.0, we're going to be able to better assess what's the size of the jump, but we don't expect that to be too difficult to migrate from one to the other. It's mostly about managing uh, deprecated, some deprecated APIs and some new APIs to consider. Nice. So well, that's exciting. I, I think a lot of people have been waiting for this 1.0 release, so they'll be really excited to actually get in there and be able to try it. And you'd mentioned a lot of early adopters going through and getting a lot of feedback from the actual community, which I think is great. Instead of just building something blindly, you're building and seeing what works, what doesn't work, and what do people want and actually prefer to use and kind of get into their workflow. So I was really curious, what did you guys learn? Are there any big takeaways that you got from the early adopters that changed your workflow or just made you make big decisions? Absolutely. This this period, this experimental period for that was probably one of the best things we could have done uh, because we basically learned a lot of things along with how users began experimenting with the technology. And we nailed the scope of 1.0 based on um, that feedback, the feedback we were receiving from uh, our user base. So um, I'm going to jump to this, sorry. So... Uh, the scope of 1.0 is um, is based on two things. One is the semantic of that version. 1.0 is super important to understand. What it means from a semantic versioning point of view for us is that 1.0 means it is a supported capability that we have the testing infrastructure necessary to track bugs and solve issues for production environment. So that's what we're trying to accomplish with uh, 1.0, um, the packages, including entities and some of the other packages compatible with it, uh, will be usable in production and we have the ability to test and fix issues on all the platforms supported by Unity. So that's really what 1.0 means. Though talking with those users, um, you know, especially people that have been long-time adopters of Dart since the early days in 2016, 2017, um, it is pretty obvious now that from a mindset point of view, it's quite of a jump. Uh, you need to reconsider how we've been doing object-oriented programming to get into a mode of data-oriented programming uh, that, that makes um, some of the architecture a little bit different. It brings tons of benefits. I'm going to show you uh, some details right after. But it is still a jump that you need to be able to achieve. So you need to have on staff people that understand what will be the implication of that jump. And that's why we're using the term season uh, Unity creators uh, here when we talk about 1.0. We believe that this first version that will be supported for production is still something that we would recommend for uh, users that have been shipping games on Unity already. 
so that you understand what are the actual limitations you are trying to break through with uh, that ECS architecture. If you haven't uh, hit any of the limits I'm going to talk about in a, in a few minutes, uh, maybe you're fine with continuing to use the existing capabilities of Unity and don't, you know, maybe you don't need to add to your stack another tool set that might not be necessary for your ambition. If you don't need to try to break those uh, architectural limits, then there is no need to uh, adopt ECS and maybe just use the basic uh, capabilities of Unity. So more specifically, what we learned from early adopters, uh, seven different things. Like we took all the feedback we, they gave us over four years and we just brought all of that into a few smaller, you know, bigger buckets of categories. Uh, the first thing that um, they told us is the, the architectural pattern, the philosophy ECS is something that um, brings a lot of flexibility in terms of gameplay development because you are forced to separate data from logic in a very explicit way, uh, all of a sudden adding and removing gameplay mechanics becomes way easier. Uh, I was chatting with uh, uh, a small studio, a GDC, and uh, they were saying um, for over 15 months of development, they introduced uh, on the, at the demand of the publisher multiplayer like in the last three months. And with an ECS architecture, they were able to bring that in pretty easily without having to re-architecture the entire game. If everything is object oriented, then there's going to be a lot of things you're going to have to break to, you know, change uh, in depth uh, the gameplay of your game. So that's one of the reasons why people are trying to get such architecture in their development because of the flexibility it brings. The second thing they told us a lot is please don't do a new Unity engine, but integrate that value progressively in the engine so that we can leverage the existing expertise. We can leverage our existing tooling or existing pipeline. We can maybe bridge existing ECS technology with game object based technology in a mix that would be the proper mix for our game, like project specific mix. Uh, and we've seen that all over the board. So everybody's been making some interesting combination of game object based systems with ECS based system because of reasons, sometimes because they felt it was easier, sometimes because they had um, existing pipeline they wanted to preserve. One studio told us, for example, uh, they they were made the entirety of the gameplay based on ECS, but uh, the netcode library, they were using a game object based netcode library that was fine because they didn't need to scale it too much. And it was an asset from the asset store and they wanted to keep that in the pipeline. So they were converting basically all the entities data to game objects before synchronizing with clients. It's nice. That sounds really good that being able to integrate and combine entities with, with dots, I think is something that everybody's been really looking forward to. And it's probably the most anticipated thing, at least for me personally. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that creates that, you know, uh, progressive transition into adopting such technology in your, you know, tool set. You don't need to adapt it all, all at once. You can probably introduce that for a specific performance or scale uh, aspect of your game and continue to use the rest uh, of Game of Jack the way you've been using it before. To make that work, though, we need a little bit of a glue. And so we, what we're shipping in Entities 1.0 is a workflow called Baking, where you can get Game of Jack data being baked automatically to ECS data. Um, and so you can use that game object, you know, um, structure of your project, but still run uh, at runtime with ECS data for performance. So that's uh, the second one. Um, then something that has been also uh, a pretty big topic is the level of control you get with an ECS system. And a lot of time it's all about the kind of devices you want to run your runtime on. Uh, uh, Unfortunately, the fragmentation of devices is a reality, like uh, especially on mobile, like there's so much different types of device you need to manage. And, and one of the constraints with Unity um, without ECS is um, that you don't have a lot of control, unfortunately, on how memory works. You don't have a lot of control on um, how the processes execute or how the threads are being scheduled. And that lack of control means that when you have 
complex constraint to expect on the target device, then you, you might have to make a concession and just basically don't not target certain devices because you can't really fit into it. With ECS, um, studios told us that they were obtaining the level of control that enabled them to really fit into those complex constraints and basically increase the amount of devices they could reach out to with the very same complexity of gameplay. That, that is nice. It also reduces the battery power, right, on the uh, the devices, all the other devices. Once you start optimizing like this, you stop beating up that processor so much. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You get control, so then you can really get to you know fixing the one thing that is that might be problematic with your gameplay. Uh, energy consumption is definitely a big one. Uh, it requires some investment to actually make that work pretty well. Uh, but when you cannot really control what's going on with memory management, garbage collection, and all those things, then you're dependent on how the framework manage all those things for you. And yeah, you don't really control how you could optimize the energy consumption. Yeah, it's great to have it automatic until you need the uh, performance. <laughs> then Absolutely. suddenly you want that control. Exactly. Um, the, the next one is um, the pure brute force performance that you will get on, uh, you know, close to native code. Uh, this is this is amazing. I mean, one of the one of the big promise of Unity in general is democratization of game development. C sharp, the C sharp scripting has made miracles, uh, you know, in making game development more accessible to a larger number of people. Uh, this is great, but definitely C sharp code doesn't, um, you know, perform as well as you would expect. Uh, so Burst and Job System are two things that help uh, get an execution of a runtime that is closer to uh, if you had done it with um, na native code, but it's still C Sharp, so it's accessible, it's pretty easy. You get all the source code of the packages coming in, but still it would run as compiled code. And so that means you're not making the compromises of accessibility to performance. You can get both, which is amazing. And ECS makes it easier to leverage bursts and jobs. Um, you can still use jobs and bursts outside of ECS, uh, but sometimes you might have important limitation to what is burstable, what is jobif jobifiable. Uh, but when you have an ECS architecture in your gameplay, then all of a sudden you can burst most of your game and you can jobify most of your game. So you can really leverage those things the best way possible. Another good selling point for entities. Absolutely. Well, that's that's why I'm here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean seriously, um, there's a lot of benefits of being data oriented. That the philosophy of being data oriented is um, promising a lot of benefits. It's not always easy to obtain the resulting benefits of being data oriented, and that's the complex goal of the ECS implementation we're trying to make in Unity, how to bring a lot of the data-oriented benefits to the larger number of developers possible. So next up is uh, data streaming. Uh, this one is also very popular and very natural. Like most of the time when we talk about data-oriented technologies, that's what we often have in mind. Uh, data is well-organized in memory, which is something that you cannot really do with game objects. Um, so you have control over the data. And you can move the data from disk to memory, from memory to memory, from a system to another system very efficiently without having to reinterpret the data. And that makes it very, very efficient. At GDC, uh, if you if you go watch some of the uh, sessions we had at GDC, we were kind of exposing some of the games over there. And um, one of that story was pretty amazing because we had um, a very um, intense um, uh, race, car racing game on Apple Arcade, and um, some of the devices there are sort of very limited, and still they were able to have a high pace, you know, um, uh, car racing game and loading, streaming the environment of the game as you actually drive it down uh, in a very efficient manner on very constrained devices just because you can really move chunks of data from disk to memory and moving move them around, uh, load and load data are very, very low cost. Nice, and I'm sure that scales up dramatically when you're on a high-end device as well. You start scaling in crazy high, insane high stuff. So that, that's one of the very exciting things. People have been asking me specifically about when this was coming in. I, I knew it was kind of hinted here. I didn't realize it was part of this. So this is going to be 
another. There are too many things I'm excited about with this. Yeah, yeah it's a, go ahead. <laughs> it's a core value proposition, definitely. You could so to a certain extent, it's um, if we think about the concepts of uh, being data oriented, you actually don't have to use dots or ECS to get some of those benefits. You could very much, you know, create your own unmanaged data blocks and start to manage your own memory yourself, uh, you know, and, and build those things like you could do with pretty much any game engine. What we're trying to do here is to bring those tools out of the box so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel and get started easily so you can just focus on your gameplay and your game and get all those tools and performance automatically delivered to you. That's what I feel like Unity has always been really good at. So now it's just doing the same at higher performance. So I, I like it. Uh, the next category is simulation scale. So simulation is a large topic. Um, it's, it's mainly when you think about um, a use case where you have a huge amount of entities in which you need to apply small behaviors. So thinking about physics simulation, for example, so a bunch of different objects that need to be simulated with forces and so on, or a large number of NPCs that would kind of be moving around with simplistic animations and behaviors that you need to repeat over a very large number of NPCs. The kind of cases uh, with object-oriented design tend to uh, explode in terms of complexity as you increase the number of um, uh, entities you need to manage. But in ECS, uh, the, the scale of that is way easier to handle. It's most likely linear in most cases, and um, you can scale to a very large number of um, NPCs or objects to simulate very easily without having to uh, make huge compromises in terms of performance. This is one of the key kind of use cases that I've seen presented, by the way, and I assume you guys see a lot. Um, and I think it, you showed earlier, it was in one of the first demos with the giant mega scale RTS with you know, hundreds of thousands of units. Is that something that you think that a lot of people using entities are are looking at? Is that one of the, the big things that people want? Is these massive scale games that are just, like you said, nearly impossible once you start getting to object oriented? Not impossible there you got to do a lot of work to to make it to make it possible once you get to these crazy scales and come up with a lot of interesting tricks so what are your thoughts on that yeah along with you know uh, streaming uh, those two categories are some of the easiest to obtain benefits out of data oriented design so when your data is kind of in a organized in a nice way, then you can all of a sudden process the data super efficiently and move the data super efficiently. And so those two ones definitely are the easiest, you know, kind of value proposition you can grasp out of data oriented technologies uh, right away, uh, right out of the bat. So that I think that that's why people get excited very much about it because all of a sudden there's a new bunch of gameplay possibilities that opens up that are pretty easy to grasp. And the last piece that our uh, early adopters have been telling us a lot about when playing with ECS is uh, about uh, scalability of multiplayer um, gameplay. So when, when we talk about multiplayer scale here, we talk about um, some of the limitation that comes directly from the architecture of game objects. So when you have a large number of networked objects, you need to synchronize every single frame. Or when you have a large number of clients that you need to synchronize it's kind of the same problem. You end up with having to loop over in memory a large number of objects that are not well aligned in memory, that are not easy to parse and process. Um, so all of that becomes inefficient pretty quickly. quickly. And so um, our early adopters have been using ECS a lot to scale up how they would actually handle larger, more larger and more complex multiplayer games in Unity. Um, so this is something that we have um, as a role in the current um, tech stream. So in the 2022 tech stream, we have both solutions coming with ECS uh, for multiplayer, but we also have uh, a solution that is purely based on game object uh, that is making its way into uh, that tech stream. And so this is the LTS cycle where we get a number of uh, tools and services for multiplayer games that make their way into the out-of-the-box offering of Unity. So it's a super exciting year for uh, multiplayer games. That is very cool. I didn't realize that was coming for both. The, that yeah, that's 
going to be really exciting. And I assume this is also really good for just high speed, like competitive style stuff, right? You, this is kind of the optimal solution when you're sending this much data as fast as possible. Yeah, absolutely. So um, if you consider the uh, um, networking libraries for a game object, then, you know, it's kind of probably you want to consider smaller uh, multiplayer games, but it's, you know, you don't need to think about dots or any of those things. So that's very, very accessible and you can just get started very easily with those things. Here we are in the domain of uh, ECS. So you're absolutely right. It's all about performance and scale. As soon as you need to have um, a pretty uh, intense when you have a pretty intense requirement of uh, performance or size of data or efficiency of sharing that data, then probably you want to get into some of those um, architecture where you have a lot of control. It's ECS is a lot about control and predictability. It's about knowing exactly how the memory is going to behave, knowing exactly how the processing is going to behave, and being able to get to the details of all those things and uh, being able to optimize um, um, the head out of it. So how can we learn more about DOTS and what's coming and how to start integrating it into our projects? Um, so like I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we are making the best effort to be connected, uh, reconnected with our users, with the community, and to share a lot of information in the most transparent way possible. So I suggest uh, a very good place to be in right now is the forum. Uh, the DOTS forum is very active. Every, every three months at maximum, we are releasing an update of the roadmap, including what is happening in terms of release and delivery, but also where we're going next steps. Uh, we have a um, public roadmap that you can get to. A public roadmap means we're exposing the scope of the actual next deliverable we have in line for us. And in that scope, you can see exactly what ECS is expecting to support uh, in its version 1.0, but also the things that are not available in that version. Um, there is a, a few systems that we would have loved to have ECS based, but we couldn't uh, so far, but it's mostly going to be coming next. Uh, so animation is one of them. Unfortunately, we don't have ECS based animation, but that's also why we need that compatibility with GameObject so you can actually solve those problems. Uh, and then there's a bunch of recent communication we made with the release of 050. That's again on the forum. And I highly recommend to have a look to some of the sessions we had at GDC because we had users on stage uh, basically explaining why they use DCS and the kind of uh, experience they got trying to do so. The good and the bad of using ECS because some of those things are amazing. It delivers a lot of value, but it also requires some efforts to um, integrate that into your game. And that's why uh, it's important to keep in mind that you need to understand why you're trying to integrate ECS in your architecture before you actually uh, embark on that journey. Right. And I think that those talks and some of those examples did a really good job of explaining and showing exactly why. So I think everybody should definitely watch those talks and probably um, at least some of those games are available. Try them out and see exactly what the result of that was and what it's like integrating it. And definitely join the forums and become pretty active in there. I find that all of those Unity forums are great places to learn a lot more about and kind of sometimes even help direct the way that things are going with Unity. If you have some really good feedback, they tend to be really supportive and just responsive there. So I highly recommend it. And I wanted to say thanks again for sharing all of this with us. I'm really excited to be able to start using this and, and seeing it kind of coming into Unity over the last couple of years. It's been really interesting and I'm, I'm just excited personally. Uh, every time I see these things, I get pumped. So, And definitely check out the Netcode for Game Object session that's coming up. It'll be really exciting and see how you can integrate that with the current workflows as well. Awesome. Thank you very much, Fabi. All right, thanks again. This session was actually recorded for Game Dev Guild, which was a live event where the attendees got to ask a bunch of questions. And next up, we've got the Q&A with all of the questions that got asked, or at least the most popular ones. There were a ton of questions on this talk. If you want to make sure that you don't miss out on Game Dev Guild the next time it comes around, make sure that you subscribe or go grab a Game Dev Guild mug. Just search for Game Dev Guild mug on Google. It'll take you right to the page and you can grab one yourself. So it's sitting on your desk and you don't miss it next year. All right.
right. Here we are. Thanks, guys. That was awesome. I think a lot of people probably learned a lot about dots that they didn't know. And I've seen a lot of questions come in. I was surprised. I expected maybe we wouldn't have a ton of dots questions. There's a ridiculous number of them. So I want to kind of get started. First, I wanted to let Andrew introduce himself since you weren't in that session and just briefly talk real quick about who you are and then we'll dive into all these questions. Yeah, sure. Hey, guys. My name is Andrew Parsons. I'm the product marketing lead uh, for programmer stuff at Unity, uh, which obviously Dots is a core part of uh, as, we, as we move forward. Um, I've been around in the industry for about 30 years. I spent 15 years as a programmer, 15 years on the dark side of marketing. So I kind of experienced both sides. And um, Laurent did a fantastic job explaining some of the fundamentals of where we're headed on the roadmap. Yeah, I think that was a, a great coverage of all of it. Let's get started with the first question. Let's just pop it right up and get going. We've got a bunch of them. So will ECS become a must-have system and mono behaviors become obsolete in the future? And they're thinking maybe like five years out in the future. Is that the case? Maybe is it 10 years? Is it next year? Is this going to happen at all? What's the uh, general thought there? Well, um, so we have also, in some ways, created uh, this understanding that uh, DOT will somewhat replace Unity Engine. And so we have to uh, be uh, transparent here. That was a little bit how we got into the DOT development from the get-go. We're like, hey, what would happen if we could reinvent Unity and just bring it to you know new high? That was, a, that was a little bit how we started the whole conversation. But since then, We've been having a lot of collaboration with early adopters of dots into production and going into production is definitely you know getting to a different story so what we learned from all the production that i've been uh, early adopters of dots is that there is a path forward that involves bringing some of those elements into your games so that you can actually get to break some of the limitations that you're looking for to get to the ambition of the gameplay you have and it's actually easier to really pinpoint and target those specific segments that you're trying to get better at without having to reinvent everything uh, from scratch. And it seems like uh, so far, that's exactly what seems to be the best um, you know, market fit in a certain way for that technologies. Um, it is very, very good at a certain number of problems. And maybe it's going to be very, very good to most of the problems of game development. But let's do it one step at a time. Let's enable every single Unity user to actually go and tackle the next challenge, and then progressively we learn to dig together where a technology needs to go. So the answer is no, not really. We're not expecting to replace the entirety of uh, the technology that is there. We will progressively break the limits so that you can build bigger and bigger games. And I'll just add to that, Jason, um, that one of the cool things that's come out of the fact that we've been building dots for, for a little while now is that we're able to leverage the uh, investments and, and, the, and the additions such as Burst Compiler and Job Systems for all uh, uh, Unity projects, including Game Objects ones. And we've even been able to take advantage of some of those advancements in our own, in the editor itself. So you're, that's why some of the performance improvements happen during compilation and, and some of the background uh, tasks because we've been able to leverage uh, Burst Compiler without, within our own code as well. So. Uh, you're seeing those those benefits uh, throughout already, even today. Yeah, I think that's one of the cool things that I kind of always expected was going to happen, even long before you guys were talking about it. I kind of figured, like, I bet a lot of this stuff is just going to slowly seep over into game object things, and a lot of it we probably won't even know that's where it came from and how it happened initially. So I have another question here that's somewhat related that I want to pop up about rendering performance. So is there something you guys can speak to about how dots may improve rendering performance in the future? Is there stuff already there? Is there something that you can talk about just to, about the scale of it and the things that are going to be possible or that become possible because of dots? Yeah, there is a lot we could uh, make as a parallel in between what you do with a graphics pipeline. Let's say when you write a shader, you're always thinking data first, like, uh, is it a vertex shutter, a pixel shutter? Like, you have to be uh, writing, processing based on the constraints of how the data is laid out and set up. And this is exactly what um, data-oriented architecture is trying to make. 
trying to make the gameplay data as well organized as possible in memory so you can move it around and process it at lightning speed. Um, so the relationship between ECS and the rendering pipeline is that it's, it's actually two things. Your ECLs will be mainly about what's happening on the CPU side of things and all the gameplay data that you're kind of taking care of on a, you know, a loop basis over your, uh, your frame. And then you basically move all the data over to the rendering pipeline and end it up for that rendering pipeline to process it and display it in the end. So it's really like a, um, a combination that you need to think about. Like ECS is not replacing any of the actual rendering pipeline processing that needs to happen in the configuration over there, but it makes the entirety of the gameplay more suitable to actually perform a great job of processing all of that out and sending all that data to run green pipeline in the best way possible. Is Andrew, did you have anything to add to that? Or should we just jump over to yeah. this next question? Let's, let's, go, let's right. go to the next one. Yeah. yeah, let's do it. So let's hit up the next question. I think a lot of people are wondering if they should use dots for relatively small games, or is this something that you only put into the giant mega triple A thing. What's your stance on that? Where where should you use this? So I would probably ask the question a slightly bit different way, but let's try to answer that question specifically the way it's being asked right now. So should you use that for a small game? The answer is yes. If the gameplay or the challenge that you have in this game require an ECS solution to a problem you have in terms of complexity within that game, and the size of the game doesn't really matter. It's more the complexity you're trying to achieve that matters. I'll give you an example. Uh, Diplomacy is not an option. You've been using uh, ECS. That's a very small game, very small development team. And uh, they needed ECS to manage the complexity of the actual crowd of enemies, you know, kind of roaming on, on the city that you're building, whatever the gameplay is. Um, I have other examples in mind, uh, like, uh, um, I, I'm forgetting the names right now, but the point being, it's not the size of the game that is important, it's the complexity of it. So um, a better question is, when is it the right time for me as a game developer to consider using ECS? And I would refer back to some of the uh, slides we've been presenting earlier. Uh, when we talked about season unity uh, creators, this is something that is important to keep in mind. We are at the beginning, we're introducing ECS-based workflows and APIs in Unity for the first time. And it will not be as easy as a lot of the other workflows that you find in Unity right away. So I would suggest if you don't already know that you have a problem that you need to solve with ECS, learn more about it first. Maybe try out a few things with a small use case to find out if it's actually useful for you and it actually does match the expertise you have on your team before you actually get into you know, doing a large game. Chances are that the game you're trying to make will be fine with game object in a lot of cases. It's really when you get into architectural complexity that requires to go beyond some of the limitation of memory management or beyond uh, you know, the mono behavior control, maybe you need to go beyond in terms of level of control of the data you have. And that's why you might want to integrate ECS. And I, I also think that you know, as programmers, we've all sort of fallen into a little bit of a comfort zone with objects. Um, Object-oriented programming has been around for a while now. And I feel like a data-oriented technology allows you to sort of challenge some of the the mechanics and uh, structures that you may be just really comfortable using and really analyze those and determine, hey, hang on a second. If I start with data orientation, I can actually build my, my game uh, architecture in this way, which actually will be a better result. As Lawrence said, it may not, it may not be the case for every situ situation, but doing that challenge to yourself, uh, I think is a good sign of a, a great programmer is always looking to see where I can improve and write better code. All right, we've got time for one more question. So I <laughs> want to jump to it really quick. And then hopefully, I don't know if you guys will be around and gather, but hopefully they're there and you can go bug them at the Unity booth. So this is the a question that I think well, it didn't get voted as high, but I think a lot of people are going to be curious about it. What level of feature parity are you aiming for with 1.0 in entities? Will there be animations that are you going to aim to have most of the features currently in the engine ported over? Or will there be some features and dots that just don't stack? And on top of that, one of the other questions is, can you 
if there isn't feature parity, can you mix and match your game object stuff in the cases where the features aren't yet in dots? Yep, um, this is exactly uh, the strategy. The strategy is integrating data-oriented technologies one step at a time. So the scope is not a feature parity. Actually, there will probably be never feature parity, you know, as long as we can actually make gains that enable creators to build what they need to build. So we're introducing that because we have thought limitations. For example, physics scalability is something that, you know, falls show pretty fast at some point when you increase complexity of your gameplay. So we need to be able to have solutions that scale, you know, dramatically to be able to do destruction of, you know, environment, all that kind of things. So um, as, as long as we can continue to solve a bunch of those problems that does not require to replace everything, then there is no point in doing it. Like we want to focus on things that enable you to create uh, the games you need to create. So there are a number of things that are not based on ECS with 1.0. Uh, we've been focusing on specific aspects. One is the ECS library itself called Entities. So that one is the basic API you need to build a gameplay based on ECS. Then we have Netcode in there. That is a fully featured Netcode library. We have a physics library that will be in there too. Uh, we've been also working with the Microsoft team, Havoc, around their version of physics uh, based on ECS. And uh, I think I'm forgetting an important one. Yeah. Anyway, so there's a bunch of those packages. Uh, please uh, come to the roadmap to see the, the full scale of it. But I can already tell you that animation is not ready uh, to be there in 1.0. The team is still working on it, but it wasn't um, ready by the time we wanted to have 1.0. Which brings me back to, in the first place, the reason why we wanted to have a 1.0 of ECS is not that it's done and complete. It will be an evolving thing. The reason why we needed to have a 1.0 is because of the version in semantic. Like, what does it mean to have a package 1.0? And that means it will be supported on the platforms of Unity, every platform that Unity supports. And if you get a problem, if you get a bug, then we will be set up to help you fix those issues and deliver back fixes and patches uh, on Unity version you're using in production, which is uh, the main issue we had with ECS in the last few years, where we've been trying out to learn what it could mean for production and games. But most of you were struggling to find out that APIs were changing all the time and that you couldn't get some of your bugs fixed because we were not set up to actually support you properly. 1.0 is about this. Every single piece of ECS that is there in uh, that version is supported for production. And from now on, we will be expanding capabilities in there to continue tackling new problems. And I think it the other package like you missed was um, uh, the hybrid renderer. Yep. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, it seems like the perfect time to upgrade, though. 1.0 is like the time to give it a try and actually start trying to use ECS and dots if you're not already doing it. But I wanted to say thanks to both of you. This has been really awesome. And I learned a lot. And I assume a lot of the people watching learned a lot. Again, if you're going to be around later for a few minutes and gather, it looks like there's lots of people there with questions they would like to follow up. And later on, I believe it's tomorrow, we've got Johnny doing another talk to dive in a little bit more into some dot stuff. So if you're interested in dots and ECS, make sure that you're around here for that as well. So thanks again, guys. This was awesome. I really appreciate it. And I hope we can do something like this.